Um, this talk about uh, behavior-driven development and the product called Cucumber um, is a subject that uh, interested me personally. It is uh, because uh, what I was looking for was a multi-language test framework. Now, we know about test-driven development, um, but most test-driven frameworks are constricted to the, a one particular language. And uh, in my search, I came across this. Also, I was teaching test-driven development to various classes, and people were saying, well, we use Cucumber, and I thought, what's that? So I had to find out, so hence the uh, curiosity. And this is what the implementation looks like. It's a Cucumber um, language. Uh, the actual language syntax is called Gherkin. Uh, the idea of behavior-driven development is that uh, the usual test-driven development is dominated by coders and testers who have to know a cryptic technical language. And so what uh, was really missing there was user acceptance testing. And so the upper half of this text shows you what users can understand, and uh, that's in the form of what's called a feature file, and that is to express the user requirements um, in complete, natural, human spoken language. And uh, so that, uh, that was the desirable goal. Um, this came about out of test-driven development where test methods were often uh, named after the function that they were testing, the, the actual unit that was being tested. And so it is based on unit testing, but taking it further. And so the upper half, yes, you can hopefully read that. And then the trick is how to make that executable. And so this is something that uh, came out in Cucumber first. And uh, the idea was that you can use pattern matching. Now in Perl, we know regular expressions. Uh, they're a wonderful way of uh, matching patterns in any text. And so if you can uh, do that, then you can match up. So the example that I display here is part of a demo. And uh, what you can see is that the upper text uh, shows uh, Sue wants to attend a talk. And then you can look for Sue in the lower source code, and you'll find a match to that, and, uh, and so on. And so these are then the uh, various actions. Um, the link between them, that's what Cucumber does, is through pattern matching then and it makes the um, requirements executable. So we now have access acceptance tests, which are driven by the upper file. Uh, that is, in fact, controlling an orchestration. And so the orchestration determines what of the lower code is going to be executed. And your good old friend, test more, is down here with OK, etc. And so it is back to Perl at that point. Uh, well, this is the, the uh, promise that uh, Cucumber makes. And so, as a development, make it a bit bigger, I think. Yeah. We have um, some implementations to look at, and I'll show you more. But uh, the main ones that matter is that this was first built in Ruby. And so, that was the initial implementation. And then for Perl, we have Pete, and uh, we have a version uh, that's been here for a few years now. And uh, that's also available. So, very nice to have that too. And I'll be demonstrating that if the laptop doesn't let me down. So, okay. How to get started with Cucumber? You go to cucumber.io, and uh, that will have to be a bit smaller, and the Cucumber has numerous implementations, and this was a recent shot out of there. Uh, the ones with green buttons are officially supported by the Cucumber team, and you'll notice that Perl is not among them. Perl is with a blue button, which indicates that it is semi official, which means that they do recognize it and uh, understand that it is compliant and compatible, um, but uh, semi-official. And uh, then Perl's in good company because it's there with C Sharp, PHP, Py uh, Python, Go, and quite a few others. So I've got some demos of those as well, demos, slides at least. And uh, so getting started, you get started with that. But so Ruby, which is shown as the third one here, uh, was the original language. And I think most of Cucumber's attention is now spent with those upper languages. And I'll show you a few. Um, and so here's one. Oh, yeah, sorry, about uh, the specifications. Um, it was a clever idea to be able to have multiple spoken languages, multiple human languages, and this is because it's user acceptance. And so I've lived in South Africa, and so I thought of something about South Africa there, and uh, that's the first language on the list, Afrikaans. And so uh, they have many languages, as you can see, uh, quite a range. And this enables these test specifications to be understood by end users 
or stakeholders in a project and uh, they can see it speaking their language. You can still extract using your wonderful pattern matching, you can extract your, your numeric uh, values there, etc., and make them parameters for your test methods. So it integrates very nicely with the underlying code. And so that integration I'll show you later. Um, there are more languages. Uh, here's a few more. And um, so, in fact, that's the second one on the list. And uh, that's Arabic. And uh, then the list goes on. So you can see that uh, there's been a great uh, diversity of languages added. Um, and uh, all this is documented on the site as well. That's where I gleaned this list as well. And I'm busy writing a scraper so that I can actually synchronize my own database of languages from the official Cucumber site as well. There's a little utility I'm working on. Um, some of these languages are fictitious languages. You'll scan them and maybe notice a couple of funny ones like Pirate and so on. But uh, yeah, most, most of these are usable languages. Right. How it then relates to uh, our code um, is that you need to do that pattern matching. Uh, again, from the site, uh, I've just chosen another implementation language, one of the top nine, which is official. This is ML, which looks a bit Lisp-ish, and yet it's not Lisp. And uh, so you can see a very different function there. I chose this one for the irony that even in this language, they're using a Perl library to do the pattern matching. Do you notice that? So uh, yeah, Perl is out there in many more ways than, uh, than you might imagine. Of course, the PCRE, the Perl Compatible Regular Expressions, is a hugely popular library as well. So uh, many regex uh, implementations in things like C Sharp on .NET and Java, etc., they all rely on the Perl compatible <laughs> library as well. Okay, and so you can, if you squint, you can still see the uh, testing syntax, the testing philosophy, and what they are doing is a different kind of assertion, which is towards the end, and that's about uh, where is it? Uh, yeah, state false or something. So that's probably how that language does the okay that we're used to with with test more. Um, Another feature is that you can do uh, data-driven testing. And so here we can see the format. And uh, I've switched back to Perl syntax for us uh, in this course and uh, in this uh, lecture, I mean. And uh, so over here, the example is that you can tabulate your inputs and then check your outputs as well. And uh, you can grow that list. Again, it speaks the user language. It's quite friendly. Uh, now you can see in the upper part that the syntax of that is called Gherkin syntax that uh, we are now using some markup, so it is the less than and greater than symbols, a little bit of substitution going on there. But um, it is, uh, nevertheless, it is uh, still readable, I think, to most people. And remember, you can still do this in Afrikaans and 73 other languages. So that's OK. And then the uh, code below is a runnable example. So this does work, and uh, you'd be able to uh, see those things happening. So I've chosen a few personalities from the Perl community for the scenarios. Um, for your test cases, I was saying that uh, in earlier test systems, they would often um, name the test methods after uh, the function being tested. Um, in this behavior-driven development, they in fact recommend making distinct scenarios. And so that's why the word scenario is part of that uh, whole uh, structure. And that you use individual people's names, which are quite recognizable, memorable, etc., and friendly. And that way you can tell your cases apart. So it is in fact there for the pattern matching. And that's why the, the line nil is important here, because uh, it's about matching the nil in the pattern over here. And yet in this last then example, which is doing the actual unit assertion, um, the word nil is not there, because this one can be reused for Sue and for Phil and for everybody else. And so this is where you can choose which patterns will, which uh, methods will be reused multiple times. So for example, this is adding, but then maybe you want to test a subtract as well. They're both going to look for an answer. So you don't need separate, separate uh, 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 verification for the, the then. So you can reuse the then code in more than one scenario. Um, right. Uh, regular expressions for the coder was a bit scary. And so uh, some people don't get on too well with regular expressions. Uh, if not, uh, Cucumber thought of an alternative. They call them Cucumber expressions instead of regular expressions. And so we have it there. And uh, the idea is that they have really created aliases for the most popular regex expressions. And so we have the int float word and string. Um, it is extensible. So if you want to go all into totally cu Cucumber expressions instead of uh, using regexes, 
you can do that as well uh, using custom, but then you're just going down another programming rabbit hole, so I'm not sure if you've really gained anything by choosing that. Um, but the idea is that it does work, and so you can see then the cucumber expression being used. Uh, a subtle difference between that and the previous slide is, notice here, given QR, when QR, etc., and that changes here to um, uh, given or when or then, and just a string rather than uh, a QR. So uh, that's different. Oh, and I, I stole this example from Ruby. So I, I, you can see here how multi-language it is, and that was my expectation. I was hoping to be able to uh, execute tests in multiple languages, partly to compare the languages against each other, partly to do benchmarking, um, other types of metrics, such as RAM overheads or whatever I care about, uh, to be able to judge which language would be most appropriate for a given task. And my actual area of interest would be databases mainly. So uh, therefore, the tables part is useful as well. Right, so yeah, you can see how that would work. Uh, some examples, then these are uh, executable as well. And this one is using test BDD, BDD Cucumber. So this is the one that you can get from CPAN, bigger. And um, so this is the code. So there'll be a feature file above this, which uh, causes these regexes to be matched. And uh, yeah, you can, of course, uh, go to arbitrary complexity with that if you want. Um, this one is testing some database. And so uh, I was interested in that, as I said. And so this would be to verify that the correct content appears in the database. So uh, this is about some, some of those operations. Um, here's another one. And uh, from the main Cucumber site, the uh, example in Ruby, they show fairly complete examples there, too. This one's fairly trivial, uh, just uh, yeah, is it what day of the week is it? And then here we can see the Ruby code for that. Uh, more languages, Go. A uh, bit more verbose, as you can see. I don't have the credit for the URL, but um, that is the Go language. Um, I'm interested in that one too. It's very efficient as a compiled language, so it's statically compiled, therefore less dynamic. It has some wins and losses uh, on that, but uh, yeah, it could be good, and so you can see how it may be more difficult to develop in Go uh, if you are accustomed to Perl, but uh, it works. It works okay as well, and you could go on, of course. So we saw at the top there that uh, up to semi-official, there are nine plus six more 15 languages that are either f official or semi-officially supported. Uh, here's JavaScript. Um, this one, um, uh, John Davis helped me with developing examples, which we might not have time for now, but uh, John's uh, work included this as well, and he found quite a few glitches or gotchas with timing in JavaScript, and that's because JavaScript is asynchronous, and so you don't really know when things are going to be executed. It all randomly depends on other factors uh, as to when callbacks would be called, etc. And so, as a result, this probably works, uh, but it may display some error messages at the end saying that uh, some things weren't called or weren't called on time properly or whatever. So it's all about the asynchronous uh, processing model, the event-driven uh, flow control that they use. But it's still possible, so it's nice to know. Uh, here's another one. That's uh, obviously C Sharp for .NET. Um, I had some difficulty getting this one to work on Mono. Uh, however, if you jump into Windows and use Visual Studio, then it's a walk in the park. So uh, you can do that. It's OK. And it uh, gives a very nice result. It also integrates, then, with your graphical tools. And so if you have a graphical desktop integrated development environment, then all of that will just click a button and you'll say click test and it displays a test result report or something. So it's really nicely done on the GUI as well. Uh, yeah, this syntax is very similar to Java and um, therefore you can see those kind of long method names that I mentioned. Um, I do prefer the Perl approach, I have to say, especially when our tests, for example, can have the comment after a test because that's nice extra readable annotation or extra documentation as well. But it's good to see the multiple languages there. OK, there's also a feature in Cooper Cucumber uh, called Wire Protocol. And um, this is so that you can do remote testing. And this interested me also because I wanted to uh, compare different languages. And so sometimes the thing running the test framework and the thing running the application would be two different languages. And so they would necessarily be in two different processes. Well, you can separate your processes either in the same computer or even in different machines. So it is inter-process communication. Of course, Perl is just brilliant for that. So we have all the TCP, et cetera, stuff. And uh, we've just had a, a lesson on how that's going to evolve in future. But um, yeah, this Cucumber will work with that sort of stuff as well. And so it's quite happy to. So you can see there's a, a doc for how to do that, et cetera. 
I think with later versions of Cucumber, they stopped doing this uh, a lot of the time. Okay, five minutes to go. But um, yeah, the idea is that you can separate the work, and it also separates logically. You can see into two sets of files. So you've got on the left the client, and that is the user acceptance part. And so the first wire client was, of course, Ruby. And so that's how I tested my own Perl implementation, which, uh, which we'll briefly look at as well. And um, so it was nice to have a Ruby client there being the official one, and that makes it, it's a kind of good stick to ensure that you are sticking to the specification and, and not uh, deviating in some way. And then the server is whatever you want. So in my case, a little Perl server. And uh, so, yeah, then what I started just earlier this year was a minor rewrite or uh, an alternative to the standard built-in um, Cucumber, which is the one from CPAN. And uh, so these were some of the things I had. I must just shrink this because screen size looks different here. Okay, well, there was more. Because I have quite a to-do list, as you can see, so I'm far from done. Um, but uh, the idea is to uh, add some more features to it, uh, to bring it up to date with Cucumber 3, because that's also moved on, and um, then to be able to yeah, perform um, all these extra things as well. So those people who, uh, who have used Cucumber a little bit uh, will probably recognize what those phrases mean, those to-dos, and uh, will then realize uh, what extra work has to be done. So yeah, it's been nice, it's been good. I'll try a little hands-on demo, just hoping not to, not to knock any cables. Uh, so we'll come out of full screen mode, and the list we'll start is with here. This is um, the standard Perl module doing a test. And uh, so I'd like to show you the source code as well for that. So that would be, and then uh, CRUD. So this was the database example. And here is the source code of that. Um, and so what you can do is, uh, yeah, you can uh, specify as many uh, scenarios as you want, etc. cetera. Um, and uh, that's then the, the structure. You're allowed to indent it a bit more. I've just realized that uh, some more indenting would be good. What I'm going to do is show you a failing test, because that's the fun, of course, and that's why it works. So let's say that, uh, yeah, over here, that we set the temperature to 12.1, which it should have been, and then it comes back with a 12.2. It's just a tiny difference, but uh, enough to cause a problem. So we'll then save that, and then we'll run the test again. Well, now I want to show you the test code as well. So, sorry, the, the other file, which is in the step definitions. Um, and it's going to be that one, thanks to, thanks to John. OK, and so this is our Perl code to implement those tests. So what you saw is the specification, which can be run against any of those languages. It is programming language independent. Then you get down to your language, and it has to do this kind of work. and. Um, so before and after are, as it were, setting up your fixtures. And then the main heart of it is these givens, thens, whens, and so on. And so that is the, the main code. And so that's that pattern matching that I showed you in the slide. Thanks. And uh, therefore, uh, well, you can see how the Perl code would run. So OK, you recognize Perl testing. I'm sure you do that. So we'll assume that you can understand it quickly. And then we'll just watch it run under the fail conditions. And that's the, the runner. And this is what goes, what happens when it fails. And so it tells you pretty exactly what your problem is. And uh, that's prob almost user-readable. And certainly readable by the developer who uh, obviously created the problem. And so to fix this one, we'd go back in and then just restore the original file. So we'll put that back. So this is a very short demo given the uh, problems. And so we'll just save that again. And then that should be back to working. So we'll just verify. That's OK. Thanks. One minute to go. Um, I was, in fact, planning to stop a little early for questions. And so running out of time now was a bit of a problem. But I'd rather have this last minute for questions. So please, do ask. Yes. Yes. Um, I'm not aware of nesting. It doesn't seem to, to do that, to bundle up lots of little things into a big thing. So it does seem to be flat as a, as a hierarchy. Uh, what I have seen is that people just stack lots of feature files into the same feature folder. 
Um, and there are businesses that are using this at scale, so they are running hundreds and then thousands of tests. So it, it does do that, yes. Mm. Yes. Okay. Yeah. It's a common question, which is how, how the development process of test-driven development is done with these tools. And uh, in Cucumber, they have a little uh, story for that, which they call the three amigos. And this is that uh, three different uh, types of domain experts uh, meet informally, and then they decide how to do it. The one person is the end user representative, and this would be uh, for coming up with user stories, and that would be, in our case, the, the actual scenarios, etc. However, the person who's uh, coming up with those probably isn't able to, to put them into the Gherkin syntax. And so you do need a test developer for that. So the developer would be the one, and um, so this is the case with many test driven systems. And so it's about in an agile way, meeting frequently, having short little sprints about that, and reviewing progress, etc. And uh, yes, so once your specifications are uh, established in this language, at least the user can sign it off. The user can agree, oh yes, well that, that is what is wanted. Yes? So just to jump in to add on that, the real magic happens when you get a developer, a tester, and a business analyst sitting down and coming out to these together. Because the developer is saying, Okay, more questions? Is our time up?